So as you can tell each week as we watch that, it's very important that we do because it gets us in a mindset of understanding that small things have a big impact, right? Amen? Small things have a big impact. Small decisions have a huge impact on life. And as I was studying for this week, <clears throat> I actually questioned the whole fact of moving back into this series because there are a lot of events that's happening in the world right now that have a lot of people asking questions and wondering what's taking place. And so I thought maybe we need to pause and, and talk about those events, talk about, you know, what is actually happening and why things are happening and, and the ins and outs of that. But then as this week kind of unfolded, everything just started to mesh into one. And so we're actually going to talk about and, and lean into some of the current events this, that's happening right now around us, but also jumping back into this series because I believe that God has something so amazing planned for all of us, and it pertains to this very idea of habits. It's those daily things that you do that that make up who you are and the way of life that you live. It's the things that, that on the outside people identify with you and, and they know you for who you are. It's like, hey, that is, you know, Derek, and, and this is how Derek behaves and this is what Derek believes. And the same thing is true of each and every one of us, that our habits are our way of life. And what we've gleaned from this, what we've pulled away from this is from a verse that John writes in, in his, uh, not his gospel, but an, actually an epistle that he writes to churches in the first century, 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, and he says that if, if whoever claims to live in Christ, that's where we're going with this, throw that up there for me, Mike, whoever claims to live in him, say these words with me, must live... <clears throat> Now listen, I know we're not all enthusiastic about that, okay? And it's scary, but we're going to say it again together. We're going to say it. Whoever claims to live in him, what? Must live as Jesus did. This is a huge statement. And if that's true, then learning about the habits of Christ and examining his life is so very important for us. Because listen, I'm looking around the room and I see people who claim to be in Christ, who live in Christ. Who claim that Christ lives in you through the power of his Holy Spirit. And there's a reason that that spirit lives in you because that spirit is now your life that is within you. That's the life of Christ. Not you anymore, but Paul says that we've died and we've gone on. We, we allow the spirit now to be our life. And that's a powerful statement. It's an important statement. And Jesus says then the way that he lived his life, he reveals to us in this, uh, this, this prayer that we've been talking about from John chapter 17. Here's a list of those things and a few of the things we've already covered and where we're at today. But Jesus reveals through some I statements the way he interacted with his disciples. And he said, number one, I was present with them. I showed up. I showed up and I was present. And we talked about the fact that you matter and your presence matters. Your presence matters as the church, the local church gathers. Your presence matters in service opportunities. We have to show up in order for people to see. And your presence, your attendance to things, your participation in things, it matters more than you'll ever believe. And then <clears throat> to proclaim, we talked about studying scripture, that it's hard to, uh, to proclaim the promises of God when you don't know the promises, right? And so we talked about studying and listening and learning from people and then sharing what we learn with someone else. What a great habit of saying, hey, you know, I heard this verse today. Here's what it said to me, and I just want to share that with you. And then the third thing was prayer. And we said that through the habit of prayer, we connect with God. Through the habit of prayer, we hear and we receive from God. Through the habit of prayer, we are letting our hearts be known and that honesty erupt out of us. And, and we saw that in Jesus' life that he was guided by prayer. And every day, in every event, every decision, he paused to pray to the Father. And he taught his disciples that it was so radically important that even they, after all the things he could have taught them, the one thing we have them recorded in saying, Lord, teach us. They didn't say teach us how to perform miracles or teach us to walk on water. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. Because what you got going on with the Father is something that we want for our lives. <clears throat> and then a few weeks ago, we talked about protection. And in protection, uh, we talked about the fact that you know, sometimes we have to be protected from ourselves and we have to protect other people, our disciples, the people that we love and the people that God has given us. And we have to protect us from ourselves because we have uh, self-defeating and, and self-sabotaging habits, don't we? Huh? Yeah, we do. And you need protected from that. And we have teachings and beliefs and things that, that we follow sometimes that, that aren't correct. There's teachings out there in the world. That's some of the stuff that we're facing right now. There are ideologies out there that are being taught that are false, that are not of Christ, 
that don't bring life but bring hatred and bring death. And we need to protect ourselves from that. We need to protect our children and our grandchildren and future generations of Christians from false teaching. We need to teach the truth. And we went on to talk about threats and all sorts of good things. If you missed that, you can go back and check that out. But today what we're talking about is actually practice. The habit of practice. Practicing our faith. Now, <clears throat> we all know the old adage about practice, right? Practice makes what? Practice makes perfect. But here's the funny thing about that. Nobody actually believes that. Not one person. <clears throat> Practice makes perfect. But we say it, sounds quippy, sounds fun, right? But that's not true. Practice doesn't make perfect. A better statement, and I believe that 100% of you will agree, practice actually makes progress. Amen? Practice doesn't make perfect. Listen, I have practiced things and practiced things. I am way far from being perfect. Anybody in here practice something enough you're perfect at it now? You know, you practice keyboarding, you never mistype anything anymore, right? Yeah, you don't need autocorrect anymore. Uh, you have practiced basketball to the point that you never miss a shot. Anybody? Football, you always catch the ball, right? Every time. No, of course not. We know that practice doesn't make perfect, but a, a more believable statement is that practice makes progress. And you can actually see this in every area of your life. You can see this in your career as you practice the, the goals and the, the, the expectations of your job. And, and over time, you get better at what it is that you're called to do or what it is that you're paid to do in your occupation. And then you can see this at school. You know, students, if you're studying, you know that as you study and as you practice the content that you have been given, you do better on exams. You, you make progress in your knowledge and what you learn. We could take this into the sports arena if we want to, and we know we can watch athletes like Steph Curry, who has an amazing practice regime, or Kobe Bryant, when he was still with us, he had an impressive practice training uh, regimen, and they even said it, it, it marveled and it surpassed even Michael Jordan's. That you could see it, though, in his effort. You could see it in the way that they play. And maybe you have a favorite musician or whoever it may be, and you know that they put a lot of practice into their art, into what they do. And that has caused progress to happen in their life. But the thing that has led them to this, this idea, is commitment. The main idea of practice is committing yourself to something and it becoming eventually a habit. And the way that it works for us, the thing that we see in this, is the commitment increases our capabilities. It increases your capacity of knowledge and even physical ability, of talent even. It increases our capability, and as our increased capability continues to grow, then one thing that comes with it is confidence, isn't it? When you stand up here and you've never practiced guitar before, let me put the guitar in your hand. Please lead worship this morning. Would you feel very confident having never played the song? I would not feel confident going out on the floor for a UK basketball game. Nope. You do not want me doing that, right? The game is not going to be won in that capacity. I, as I became you know, a teenager and learned how to drive, my commitment to driving and to practice, and some of you are going to face that. We've got a young lady that's going to be facing that in a few years. I hope that her capacity and her capability grows so that she grows confident in her ability to, to maneuver herself around this world in very dangerous environments, right? We know this to be true. The same thing is even true in our relationships. As you are dating or even as you get married one day or if you're married right now, if you just slip into marriage and say, okay, I'm just content with being married. This is great. But you never put any commitment to it or any, any practice into loving your spouse. Ladies, what's going to happen? It's not going to work real well, is it? But as we commit to our marriages and we grow in our capability of love and forgiveness and mercy and grace and just, you know, figuring things out, we grow confident in our trust for one another. We grow confident in our futures together. This exists in, in so many areas of life. And the opposite is true too. Practice makes progress, but no practice means no progress. And maybe even to go deeper into that is no commitment means no confidence. 
Now, you've probably met people, maybe you've been that person. I've been that person before. I thought I was confident. Actually, what that's called is arrogance, right? It's arrogance. I didn't really have confidence because I hadn't committed to anything to build that up in my life. And as I said, this is true across all aspects of life, and it's especially true when it comes to our faith. There are truths that we possess and teachings that we possess, teachings that we're not supposed to just hold on to, but we're supposed to share. And when we fail to commit ourselves to the process of, and practicing of our faith, our capability of handling the word of God, which we're told we're supposed to be able to handle the word of God, right? Unashamed, confident. But instead, a lot of times we don't see this. There's no commitment and there's no confidence. And I've become maybe in my own life of seeing this, I've determined that that's one of the main reasons that Christians lack confidence is because simply they lack the commitment and the practice of their faith. Now, the question is why do we do this? What stands as a barrier and as an obstacle to our commitment? And one of the things that I find to be true over and over again as I talk with people and even, even as I examine my own life, it's comfort. Comfort actually is the barrier between becoming workers, between believers becoming workers in the kingdom of God. Comfort a lot of times is the barrier, and, and I don't mean things are good, you know, that, that, that's a bad thing. But it's when as Christians we become comfortable with the fact, hey, God saved me. God, thank you so much, right, for saving me. But then we stay there. And what's lost to us is that God has so much more planned for us. Comfort in just enjoying the things that God has for us means that we are so me-minded that we haven't transitioned to being others-oriented yet, and that's exactly where God wants to lead us. There's a barrier that exists, and so we're believers, but we're not workers in the kingdom yet. We haven't made it that far. We haven't matured to that point yet. See, comfort like commitment has its own progression. Comfort leads to complacency. Maybe you've seen this before. We grow awful comfortable in some bad habits, and eventually we become complacent. Things don't matter as much as they used to. True or false? And complacency oftentimes will lead to a collapse if left alone. Again, let me revert back to a job or to a relationship or to a marriage if we're comfortable for just being in it, well, I got hired, but I have no commitment to the cause or commitment to the job or commitment to the relationship. Eventually, I become complacent in that environment. And then eventually, complacency will lead to collapse. I'll lose my job or the relationship may be broken. And then we suffer the strains and the pains of living in this state of perpetual comfort. Now, how does this play into our faith? Well, see, one of the things that we read throughout the New Testament is that God did, in fact, save us through Christ. But God not only saves, but I want you to say this word with me because I believe this word is so important in understanding who we are as Christians. So we're going to say these two sections, but when we get to the middle section of that little word with three letters, I want you to say it real loud. Okay, here we go. God saves us and sends us. God saves us and not <clears throat> and might. God saves us and well, he would like for you to go, to be sent. But as we read through the New Testament, as we're going to see today, God saves us and he sends us. He saves us and yes, there's comfort in that. Yes, there, there's this wonderful, wonderful thing that happens. And it's warm and it's fuzzy and it feels good because Jesus loves us. This I know, Jesus loves, right? But our salvation is not just meant for us, but it's meant to move through us. And we become a conductor. We become a vessel for somebody else in this world. And I, and I think this is true. Our tendency oftentimes is to embrace being saved. We like to claim that because that's for us. But we don't embrace what we're going to call our sentness. We oftentimes don't embrace that God not only saved us, but he's called you to be sent into the world. And I don't mean you have to go to Africa or Asia. He's sending you into the lives of the people around you, the people close to you, 
the people, in fact, that we believe he's given to you, the people that you claim to love the most. God is sending you to them. That's where we intersect with Jesus' habit here in his prayer today. So let's take a look at it. John chapter 17, verse 18. Here's part of the prayer today we're looking at. This is what Jesus says. He says, as you have sent me into the world. That's the first part. And remember, he's praying before he's going to be arrested in the garden, before he's going to the cross, this last prayer with his disciples. They're all gathered around, and he's revealing to them through this prayer what he's been doing for them. And he says, Father, as you have sent me into the world, there's a comparison, I have sent them into the world. And we look at that and go, oh man, Jesus, he had purpose. There was a reason that God sent him and there's a reason that Jesus sent those disciples and it intersects with your life and mine too. So what we're gonna do for the next few minutes is break this verse down into two sections. The first part is as you sent me, as you sent me into the world. What that teaches us and what Jesus is saying is that God is a sending God. Let's just say that together. God is a sending God. He's a sending God. From the very beginning, let's look at Genesis chapter one. He creates human, mankind, right? And he says, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to fill the earth. I want you to increase in number and fill the earth and subdue it. I want you to go. And then we get to Genesis 11 and humanity says, well, I don't think we want to do that anymore, right? Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that, there's a purpose in this, we may make a name for ourselves. You know, I think we know better than what God wants, right? They say otherwise, which means the opposite of this would be a negative. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And God's like, yeah, that's the whole point. That's what I want you to do. I don't need you to make a name for yourself. I want you to go. Don't group together and just stay but I want you to go. And so what does it tell us that God did? So God scattered them from there all over the earth again. Go. Because God's ascending God. And then we look at the story of Abraham, right? Abraham, I'm calling you out of the city of your ancestors and I'm sending you to a new city. I'm sending you to the promised land. Isaiah, Jonah are other examples. Jonah, I need you to go to Nineveh to talk to the people. I need you to go. And what did Jonah say? I ain't going, right? I'm hopping on the boat. In fact, I'm going to go the opposite way. And God said, yeah, you think you are. But I've got a plan for you. And then Isaiah, a prophet of God with multiple prophets in the Old Testament that we read about. God says, I need you to go and be my mouthpiece. And Isaiah says, here I am, Lord. Say it with me. Send me, right? He becomes an example for all of us. That we know that God is ascending God, but we also have a response in this. Eventually, though, this would lead to God sending Jesus, wouldn't it? And I love what John the disciple says about Jesus and about God sending him. In his epistle, the same one we've been reading, but in chapter 4, he says, This is how God showed his love among us. Actually, the sentness of God, the sending nature of God, is the love of God for humanity. He sent his one and only son to the world that we might live through him. He sent Jesus for you, for me, as an atoning sacrifice for our since mankind had gotten it wrong long enough. And God said, you know, it's time to, to set things straight. And he sends his son as an atoning sacrifice for us, for me, and for you, as a love offering. And I love this because what we learn is that, that Jesus embodied this. He, he embraced his sentness. He embraced the fact that, that he was sent by the Father. And in fact, it was central to his identity. And over 40 times in the Gospel of John, John records instances of Jesus saying, I was sent by the Father. I'm here to do this because this is why I was sent. Just as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. It was central to his identity. And the way that it impacted his life is through his priorities and his decisions and his daily habits, his actions, all were surround, all kind of encompassed this idea of his sentness. He was sent by the Father for a purpose. But now it takes us to the second part of the verse. As you have sent me, then I have sent them. And this is the habit of Jesus with his disciples that he had sent them out into the world with the same message that he himself had. 
When he came, he proclaimed the kingdom of God is near, and he told the disciples to do the same thing. I want you to go and proclaim the kingdom of God is at hand. In fact, what we learn is that Jesus is ascending Savior. God is ascending God. Jesus is ascending Savior. He embraced his sentness and his purpose. About himself, Jesus said this from Luke chapter 19. Luke records, as Jesus is talking about this, he says, for the Son of Man came. This was such a big statement. Luke thought, hey, we need to write this down. Whoever he was interviewing and getting this information from, this is a big deal. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's the reason. That was what was behind his sentness. That was the motivation. And do you realize That because Jesus embraced his sentness, he embraced the fact that he was sent by the Father, that you're sitting here today and you know about him because of that? Because just as God was ascending God who sent Jesus, Jesus was ascending Savior who sent disciples who would eventually spread that message and gospel around the world. And it's the reason you know about him today. There's a pattern in this to follow. Something interesting too These 12 that Jesus would would choose, specifically 12, he called them disciples. And disciples, of course, means to be students. But eventually he would anoint them. He would appoint them as apostles. And he would say, okay, the time has come. You're no longer just a student. But I'm sharing with you things that are are hidden things, things that, that part of the family, you know, gets to see. And I'm sending you out as leaders. And he called them apostles. And apostles, literally translated, say it with me, means Sent ones. Now there's this idea, well, they were the 12 apostles and nobody else is supposed to be sent because we can't do what they do. And that's not a correct teaching. That's not a correct way of looking at what Christ has planned for the church. And I'll show you through some verses here so that we can dispel that myth and you can understand that at the end of the day, you also are a sent one. You may not be a capital A apostle of the first century and lived with Jesus, but you know what? Jesus lives in you right now. And you have been called. Here in Luke chapter 6, it records Jesus talking about students and teachers. He says the student is not above the teacher. And the student is not going to be different than the teacher. If it's a true student learning from the teacher, everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Who's your teacher? Who's your master? Who are you learning from? Remember, whoever claims to live in him, to follow this teacher, must what? Be like him, live like him. But if our lives are reflecting something else, then we have to begin to wonder who our true teacher is and who we're allowing to guide us and mold us and shape us. Maybe your teacher's ESPN Sports Center. Maybe your teacher's Fox News or CNN or whatever else. But the way that we live our lives, the way that we engage with people, maybe it's the American dream. But when we read scripture and we see the words of Jesus, he says that a student of mine is going to become like me. And then there was a purpose behind it. In fact, in Mark chapter 3, we believe that Mark got his information from Peter. We, we see Jesus here in this, and he says he appointed the 12. This is Mark's kind of overshadowing of the situation. He appointed those 12 that he might be with them and that he might send them out. The reason Jesus gathered these 12 together is because it was the work that he had to accomplish while he was here on this earth. He had something that he needed to share that would be replicated and multiplied. And so he gathered these men with him with the purpose that he would eventually send them out. And 18 months into his relationship with these men, eventually Jesus gives them the call. See, it began with come and see. That's the first thing. Come and see. Come and check me out. Come and learn who I am. And then it transitioned to follow me. Let's go deeper in this. Follow me and learn from me. Be my student. And then 18 months in, Matthew records this scenario taking place. He says, now come, follow me, which is a combination of those first two. Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. That means there's a plan. That means there's a purpose. That means what you've learned from me, now I'm sending you to go do. 
And then eventually that would translate into the last thing Jesus would tell his disciples before he would ascend into heaven. He would say, therefore, stay right here and make disciples of all nations. Right? Is that what he said? No, he said, therefore, meaning because I now have all authority and power in heaven and earth is what he just referenced before this. I want you to do what? Go. Now, here's the thing. Again, I'm telling you, this doesn't mean I want you to go halfway around the world or, or whatever else. You might. But the literal translation of go means as you are going, as you are living, as you are living, working, and playing, understand that all those things need to be done in the scope of faith. And as you are going about your life, interacting with people, living amongst the, the sphere of influence that you have, I want you to be about the business of making disciples of all nations. But I need you with a go mentality and not a stay mentality. The stay mentality means you're going to get comfortable. And the fruit that you might bear, well, we know what's going to happen to it. It's going to soak up all the stuff, and then it's going to sour. And it's going to spoil. But instead, we're supposed to have a go mentality moving into the world that we know God not only saved us, but he sends us as well. And we know this then. How does that interact with our lives right here? God is ascending God. Jesus is ascending Savior. And we are sent followers. That's you. Think about this for a minute. You are a sent one. If you've been given the message of Christ, <clears throat> Paul writes that you now have a ministry, a ministry that has been given to you, which is the ministry of reconciliation and the message of the gospel of Jesus. You've been given this and entrusted this as a steward of this, that it's not just for you, but it's through you that other people will get to experience this truth. And in fact, here's what John, the same disciple we've been looking at his writings, says about this. It's incredible. Jesus, as he records what Jesus is saying, very truly I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, whoever, say whoever, Whoever, that includes you, that includes me, that includes anybody, whoever believes in me. Let's just do this for a minute. Just think to yourself, you don't have to answer out loud. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in Christ? If you've given your life to Christ, you believe that he's the Messiah, the Son of God, and that he's redeemed your life, he saved you from yourself and from your own sinful nature. Jesus says, if you believe in me, those, whoever they are, will do, say do. They will do the works. Now let's say this together. I have been doing. And another verse that so many times is taken way out of context. Because immediately what happens to us, we go live like Jesus did and do what Jesus did. Well, I can't walk on water, right? I, I can't heal people. I haven't had that, that capacity. I haven't done that before. I can't, and we just fill in the blank of all the things that superhuman Jesus did, right? But when you actually look at the translation of this, and I, I dislike poor translations, but the real translation of this and the way that it's teased out is not talking about magnitude. It's talking about scope. Greater things than me is not talking about, well, I walked on water, but you're going to hop, skip, and jump across the water, right? Right? No, that's not what that means. It means scope. Greater things are going to be accomplished. And he gives the reason why. Because I'm going to be with the Father. I've only had you for about three to three and a half years. Some of you are going to have the Spirit living in you for 30 years. 40 years, 50 years. Imagine what can be accomplished by a Christian, by a follower who takes their sentness into the world and begins to truly live with purpose and mission. <laughs> you all are going to accomplish so much more. Generations. And that's why Jesus, he, he, it says that when he sent out the 72, <clears throat> shortly before he went to Jerusalem to, to die, his last trip to Jerusalem, it says that the 72 came back after he sent them out. And they were full of joy. 
And it said that Jesus then, full of joy, seeing that this work was now complete, he starts to pray to the Father and he says, look, look at this. Isn't this good? I have accomplished the work that you've given me. He will later pray. He hadn't even been to the cross yet. But he had a work to do. And when they went, they weren't alone. And when you go, you're not alone. Remember in the Great Commission, he says, and surely I'll be with you to the very end of the age. How, Jesus, when you're gone? He says, I'm going to send an advocate to you, a comforter, a counselor to you, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, who we've already been taught about, right? And we learn that the things that the Holy Spirit will share is only what Jesus will allow him to share. He says, he'll tell you my words, and I think that's incredible. He says that this spirit will teach you all things. Yeah, because when I go, I don't really know everything, you know, that I need to say. And I, I don't really feel super confident. I mean, I, I, I know my own testimony. I know my own story maybe. Maybe you know the, the gospel and the plan of salvation. But really, you know, that commitment hasn't been there. But here's the thing, folks. If you seek to know, James says, if you lack wisdom, what should you do? Ask for it. And God will grant it to you. Seek it and find it. Jesus said, I will teach you these things. How is he going to teach us? Through the Spirit. And I'll remind you of everything that I've said to you. Well, what did you say? I said to go. Stay? No, I said go into the world, into the lives of the people around you. I told you to make disciples of all nations. I told you to love each other. How are we going to do this? Love you're not going to do it through your knowledge and your own super ability. You know what knowledge does? Paul tells us knowledge puffs up, <laughs> but love builds up. You're going to love people, and it's by your love for one another that the world is going to know that you are my disciples. How wonderful is that? We can't afford to be complacent. We can't afford to just be comfortable. That's why we're talking about this so much. There is so much at stake, and if you haven't seen it, if you haven't seen it lately, then, then you're seeing it now. The reason this is important, the reason is that we need, that we need to embrace our sentness is because there are other forces and there are other powers at work right now in this world. And let me tell you what they're doing. They're committed to their cause. And they're practicing their faith. And they're making progress. And I truly believe that in the end, <clears throat> Jesus will bring ultimate victory to all things. Don't you agree? And no matter how scary things get, and no matter how much evil, and no matter how much the hatred, and all the war around us, no matter how much it escalates, Jesus will have victory in the end. But let me say something to you that you need to understand. Until then, we have a problem. And there's a huge problem. Because the enemy is gaining ground. And when Jesus talked about ground, he wasn't just talking about the surface of the earth. He was talking about the hearts of mankind. And the enemy <laughs> is practicing their faith and their ideologies. And they're making progress. And when we talk about making progress, that's hearts and minds that are kept away from the truth of Christ. And we can't afford that. We can't afford to get so wrapped up in what's going on that we lose sight that right now there's a mission that has to be fulfilled. And you've been given that mission, and it's right around you. We think that it's in the distance, and it's just maybe in the Middle East. Folks, it's all in our nation. It's right around you in every town and every city. It's in your home because that's where the enemy begins with you. If you have children and you have grandchildren, Practicing your faith and living a sent life, even in your house, is so important because you're the first line of defense. Jesus told his disciples, and I believe this to be true, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The problem is not the hearts and minds of people because Jesus has already told you and he's told me, it's not about how you present it how well you present it, how much you know. But he knew one thing, if you didn't commit yourself to the cause, you wouldn't have confidence to go. So you gotta commit. And you gotta increase in your capability and your maturity. And then you go in confidence and share the gospel in the face of danger. 
in the face of persecution, in the face of people possibly saying no or making fun. But that's not your responsibility. Your responsibility isn't to coerce them or convince them that it's true. You just are supposed to state the truth. The harvest is plentiful. This world is primed and hearts are primed. But the workers, this is the problem, the workers are few. And where are the workers? They're the comfortable ones sitting in the pew. That rhymed. I didn't mean for it to, but that's pretty cool. It's when we get so comfortable that we decide, yeah, I like being saved, but I don't know about the scent thing. I mean, I want to commit my life to Christ, but I don't know if I'm really going to follow, right? I mean, that's... Do I have to do that? I mean, I'm not the capital A apostle, you know, so maybe that's not for me. Whoever believes in me will do the things that I've done and that I'm doing. So here's where the the challenge comes in. The next thing Jesus says is a bomb because with his disciples... He says the worker, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And I'm sure the disciples are thinking, well, what are we supposed to do, right? And he says, so ask the God of the harvest to send workers into the harvest field. So ask the God of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. And here's my challenge for you. Would you be so bold as to make that your prayer? Would you be so bold as instead of flipping on the news and getting so wrapped up in it and just, you know, downcast, man. I mean, I found myself watching and and watching as everything unfolded, and that's fine. Be informed. But I found it starting to to mess with me a little bit. It started to to affect my, my mentality. It started to affect my life. And I thought, that's not our focus. I mean, this is going to escalate because humanity escalates. Or it's gonna be pushed back again for future generations. But we know that. It's just going to stay tense because the only person that brings peace is who? So what should I be doing? Number one, Father, I need to be praying for these people. Pray for people, both Jew, Palestinian, Christian, and I even hate to say it, gritting my teeth, terrorist alike. But that's the truth. Because the message of Jesus is for all people, for every heart. And no matter how bad the heart has been, you understand that the Apostle Paul was a terrorizer to the people of Christ. You understand that? He sought the death of Christians. (laughs) But God had a plan for him. Lord forbid our hearts become so hardened that we don't pray for the people around this world who are suffering because of their faith. Many of them suffering just because of who they are, because of their association. And you know what Jesus said? People are going to hate you talking about Christians. They're going to hate you on account of me. They hated me first, and they're going to hate you too. Trouble's coming. And the the problem that I see in this is that we say that we have no hope, we have no promise for tomorrow. You know, tomorrow's not promised, but you know what? That's a false statement too. It's kind of like practice makes perfect. That's a false statement. Yeah, you have a tomorrow. It may not be on this earth, but you're guaranteed a tomorrow somewhere. And people are either going to be with God for eternity or they're going to be separated from him for eternity. This is us right here. This is our response. Ask the God of the harvest to send workers into the field. And here's what I pray happens. I pray you begin to pray that. I pray that you get committed to this and you begin to pray and you're practicing your faith. God, you are true and faithful. Let's let's do it. Let's pray this prayer together. And it just might so happen to be that the worker he wants to send is you. And how glorious that will be. But what if... A church decides that they're going to embrace this idea that God not only saves us and, right, he sends us. And you and I have a heavenly father who is a sending God. And we have a savior who is a sending savior. And we have to embrace and begin to practice the truth that we are sent followers into this world. 
If you find yourself in comfort and complacency, and you find yourself perhaps with your faith eroding around you, or you don't know where to turn or what to do, hey, listen, we have plans for you. God has a plan for you, and we want to work together to accomplish his mission and his will in your life and in this community and in this church. And so I pray that you'll begin praying this together. I pray that you'll take this seriously and begin, like Jesus, to practice being sent into this world. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you for your truth, no matter how difficult it is at times to hear. We thank you for the truth of the gospel that, Father, you loved us beyond us. And that when it comes to sin, it's black and white. There, there's, there's no gray area. We're either innocent or we are guilty. And all of us without your son are guilty and deserving of the highest punishment of death. Because you are a holy God. But out of your mercy and out of your grace and forgiveness, you, Father... You've led us to this place. You've led us to mercy. You've led us to salvation. But we dare not stay there. Father, give us the wisdom that we need to know the good we ought to do and to know the word that we are to share with this world and give us the humility to, to surrender ourselves to your kingdom and your purpose and not our own. And Father, would you, Give us the strength and courage empowered by your Holy Spirit. Teach us and remind us everything that you've said. Give us this purpose and give us this passion today. That may we practice our faith and may we love those around us. May we give our lives to your cause and be committed. And Father, I pray that the progress we see is the day that we enter into heaven surrounded by clouds of witnesses who are celebrating each and every person for the investment that they made in their lives. And then we get to see heaven filled with the least of these and with the worst of these and with the best of these because it was all for your glory and it was for your kingdom. God, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you that we've had the opportunity to be here. Now, Father, I pray that through everything we've experienced that you now will send us into this world to accomplish your will. Help us practice our faith, and we pray that in the matchless name of Jesus, our Savior. And everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here.